Praise God. Praise God this morning. Amen. He is our firm foundation today. Amen. Let's take our seats together. Hey, I'm not sure I can follow that today. Wasn't that amazing? Oh, come on. If you weren't feeling Christmassy before, you should do now. Can I give you a little bit of an insight into the behind the scenes? So Ailey said, Kath's got something and she's going to be helping the kids out. So normally, I am sat at the front with two tennis rackets. And one tennis racket, we're very high tech in kids' church, one tennis racket has a smiley face on. Because when the kids come up here, most of them look like they're going to the dentist sometimes. Like, and we're like, we need you to smile. Not scary smile, just nice smile. So I have one with a smiley face on. And then the other tennis racket has an arrow on. And that goes, sing louder. Because, you know, they forget we're in a big auditorium, even from the old place. You know, it's a big place. You've got to fill your voice. But not screaming, because there's a difference between singing loudly and screaming. So I would sit here, but this platform's too high. I was like, we need to go high tech. We need to move up a gear. New building, new gear. So I said, what can I do? Because they've got the girls and they lead the dancing. We've got an amazing kids worship team who lead the dancing and they've done so well with them. So I said, well, look, I'll go at the back and I've got something. Wait till you see this. Come on, this is Kids Church Best. This is behind the scenes insight into Kids Church. So if you did not know, at the back, I'm like this. Amazing, how good are these? So I'm really sorry for the people on the seats. I was not having my own prophetic dance party at the back. I actually was signaling to the kids because I know it just looked like I was doing this, you know? But I thought when I bought these, thank you, Amazon, that I thought, these are amazing. And there's only one person in this church that I know would love these more than I love these. And I thought, these are just what we need for New Year's Eve. These are what we need for encounter nights. Who doesn't think that Leanne Seal would love these? <laughs> Merry Christmas, babe. These are for you. Bring them, bring the praise. These are, they are you, my darling. <laughs> I've got four, Tom Seal, you can thank me later. <laughs> behind the scenes, it's always good to see behind the scenes, isn't it? Ailey thanked the team, we have an amazing kids team. I'm part of Team B, we're Team Brilliant, Team Awesome is the team, eh? Thank you, yeah, Team Brilliant will be in here. We have two teams that serve every week, and then we've got Cresh and Acons and Champions. We've got a kids team in Torrey doing amazing work there. And behind the scenes, there is weeks and hours of people coming in, and I get the privilege of seeing that those people actually giving their lives and their hearts away to children, to build faith in them, encourage them in their journey. Can we appreciate those teams? They are amazing. They do a great work. And so we come this Sunday to the nativity scene again. And it may be every Christmas you come to it and it's a tradition and you see the little manger and there's Mary and there's Joseph, but there's always a behind the scenes story to the nativity scene. There was something happened before we get to that point. You know, we've even got an inflatable one in kids' church, so if you go to pick your kids up, go and see it. And we sort of think the event just happened that was a bit before the event and that's the bit we're gonna to come to today. So we're gonna to read together in the chapter of, in the Gospel of Luke and we're reading in chapter one. And I wanna tell you the behind the scenes story of a young girl called Mary, a young Jewish girl from a small country town and this young Jewish girl was in the first stages of her betrothal to a man named Joseph and I'm in Luke chapter 1 I'm going to read two parts of it and this starts out the birth of Jesus foretold in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Amen. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month, verse 37, for no word 
from God will ever fail. Come on, can we appreciate that word of God today? No word from God will ever fail. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. She goes to see Elizabeth, her cousin. She speaks to Elizabeth. And then we'll come back in at verse 46. Because the angel spoke. And then Elizabeth spoke. And eventually Mary sings a song. And it says, and Mary said in verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Amen. Let's pray this morning as we come to God's word. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its power to transform our lives. We come again to the nativity scene, Lord God, and we come and ask, what child is this? And we come to see who truly Jesus is in this season in our lives. So God, help us by your word through just like your Holy Spirit would anoint the word just to touch people's lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, from, from what we know about Mary, We know she would be a young Jewish girl and how she would have been brought up. We know that it would have been probably an arranged marriage and she was in this first stage of betrothal, which isn't quite like our engagement. It would have meant that she was promised to be married. It was set. It was going to happen. She just wasn't living with Joseph yet. And we can know something about the life that she would have had beforehand. She probably would have been taken to the synagogue. She obviously knew the voice of God and she knew the presence of God. And when she was in the synagogue, she would have had the words and the scriptures of the Torah and the prophets read to her. Because the The people of Israel knew there was a coming Messiah, and Mary would have known that if she'd have grown up in the Jewish tradition. She would have known the words of Isaiah. She would have known what he said. She would have known that he said, for to us the child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. She would have known those words. They would have sat in her heart because she would have heard them spoken into her life. And here she stands, brought by the the message brought by an angel in the promise of that new day. Those words spoken by Isaiah, there she was, being told that she was going to be part of that story. You know, last week, Ian brought the the word on actually who he was, actually as everlasting counsellor. Sorry, wonderful counsellor. There's many adjectives in this, verse, in this series. As wonderful counsellor. And he talked the story of the wise men. Today we are going to look at the story of Mary and how she stood on the start of the destiny that God had spoken into her and knowing him as mighty God. And in this season, we can know him as well as mighty God. So what can we learn from Mary as she walks through this time of understanding the part that she is going to play, the revelation of mighty God into her life? What did you want to be when you were growing up? Did you have an idea? Did you have a set plan? You know, when I was growing up, there was one thing I didn't want to be, and that was a teacher. I was not going to be a teacher. My mum was a primary school teacher. Do you want to be a teacher? No, I am not going to be a teacher. And then in the year 2000, I went off to China and I was part of a a group that were going to teach English, but I was going there really to go to China. It wasn't about the teaching. And when I was there, people said to me, you really like teaching. I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. You, You really like teaching. And I came back and I became a teacher. And you know what my mom said? I always knew you'd be a teacher. Did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? I'm pretty sure Mary had dreams. I'm pretty sure that Mary knew what she wanted to be. You know, she would have had her life set ahead of her. She would have known she would have married Joseph and she probably had a thought about having a family and growing up in this small town and what that actually looked like. But into all of that came mighty God. All of that came mighty God and life interrupted. Life interrupted. You know, first of all, life was interrupted by circumstance. 
I don't know about if it's just, if it's just me that happens to, maybe it doesn't happen to any of you, but sometimes I find that the plans I have don't always work out my way. Just me? Anybody else? Oh, amazing, just four or five of us. Oh, well, that's good. I'm really glad for the rest of you that it all works out. You'll have to give me tips on that, because uh, to be honest, you know, I make plans and then all of a sudden it shifts the other way. But you know, I'm really glad that it shifts the other way sometimes because I see the, mighty, the hand of mighty God in my life as he interrupts my life by circumstance and shifts it in another way. Do you know, I had planned, <laughs> I, I look back at it now and you laugh actually sometimes. I think the older you get, you laugh at the plans you make sometimes. But I remember when I first came to Aberdeen and I thought, right, I'm coming to Aberdeen to do a master's course and I'm coming here for one year. I will do my master's course, and I'm doing it in marine and fishery science, and I'll get my qualification, and then who knows where I'll go around the world, you know, maybe Hawaii, that would be lovely, wouldn't it, or some Bali, I'm sure they need marine biologists there. But you know what happened? God interrupted my life. Mighty God interrupted my life, and I am so glad that mighty God interrupted my life, because if he had not interrupted my life, if I had not let him interrupt my life, then I wouldn't have the privilege to be part of everything that you and me are doing here in this church, in this city. I mean, I look back at that moment, and it didn't look like this, where we were, but God had a plan, and he interrupted to my life to say, actually, I'd like you to stay here. Oh, I'm so glad that mighty God interrupted our life. He interrupted Mary's life, and he can interrupt our life through circumstance, but he can also interrupt our life with people. Do you know, I am in a school and I teach there and, you know, I live in a particular street and we all have a set of circumstances where we are. Do you know you're right where you're supposed to be? You know, it is not by chance that you have those people around you. It's not by chance that that colleague works right next to you on that desk next to you or the person that you meet in the shop every week because God has interrupted your life with people, people for you to encourage, people for you to smile at. And can I say, people for you to bear with their grumpiness and discontent, because I'd love to say the people all around us all are happy, happy, joy, joy, but they're not, are they, sometimes? But you know, there is a reason we're there. We are there to bring hope. We are there to bring life. We are there to bring love into their lives. And we have to be able to let God interrupt our lives with people. Do you know, sometimes I like to my, all, my life to be set and I'm thinking it's so comfy, even within coming to church. I do this, I work on kids' church, I do this, I do this, I do this. All oh, that we would let mighty God step into our lives and interrupt it and say, actually, right now, I want you to do this. We all need to be like Mary who responds to mighty God and says, I am your humble servant. Interrupt my life, God, with whatever you have. Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, A man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. Oh God, interrupt our lives with people, interrupt it with circumstance, that mighty God might be on display in our world. Do you know, I, I did not grow up in the Pentecostal church. I grew up in a different faith. And actually, in the faith I grew up in, Mary was almost worshipped as a god. You know, it was venerated would be the word it was used and would be prayed to. But actually, as I grew in my journey of faith and learned more about her, what I think is her true beauty is not any supernaturalness that she has. It's actually the fact of her humility and her humanity. Actually, that's what makes Mary so special, so wonderful as we see how she responds. You know, she was just a regular Jewish girl with regular problems. Imagine if an angel appeared to you and changed the course of your life in a moment. I mean, surely she had the same thoughts as I would have. What's Joseph going to say? What's my parents going to say? What are the community going to say? Will I be ostracized? How am I going to get through this? What am I going to do? All of these thoughts, I'm sure, came to Mary. When everything was stacked against her, she turned to mighty God. And in that moment, when we heard her sing a song, we heard hope declared. Her life was interrupted and then hope was declared. I'm just going to read you those verses she sings in that beautiful song. It's often called the Magnificat. It says, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers, lifted up the humble and filled the hungry with good things. 
What do you and I declare when the odds are stacked against us? Do you know, we need to declare that he is mighty God. That's what we need to declare. She had the odds stacked against her in the terms of, yeah, the angel came, but then he disappeared. I would be like, if you could just stay, and if you could just tell everybody what you just told me, we'll all be good, and everyone will believe. But he left. She had to walk out of that house and move into talking to her community. A very difficult situation. But first of all, she declared that he has performed mighty deeds. And I love the way, you know, I say it, and then I I sat there and I thought, what's a mighty deed? It's not language that we use, is it? Oh God, you perform mighty deeds. Yeah, I'm waking up today because God is going to do mighty deeds. Another version that says he's going to do tremendous things. He's going to do tremendous things. So what of that is? You know, if you're in financial need, I believe my God can do mighty deeds and turn around that situation. Are you in need of physical healing? My God can do mighty deeds. And we need to start standing on the truth of the word, just like Mary did in a difficult place and declare, you are mighty God and you do, not you might do, not you maybe will do, but you do mighty deeds for physical healing, for financial need, for emotional breakthrough. He does mighty deeds. It also says that he brings down rulers. He brings down rulers. You know, we're going to sing a song at the end, but I love this line from it. It says, your kingdom stands above every power, every living soul. Your kingdom stands above it. Now, when we sing this, I had a a picture of what it looks like, almost in the the spiritual realm, because sometimes Jesus is like um, the boxes. You know, if you've ever seen those matches, and boxes stand, and they, they eyeball each other, and they really intimidate each other, and they stand, and they look at each other. But you know, nobody can stand and look Jesus in the eye. No ruler, no power, no authority. So when I sing your kingdom stands above, I say, God, nobody can stand up to you and look you in the eye. There's not that moment when they stand up because they fall down at the feet of Jesus in awe of who he is because he is mighty God. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil. Are you worried about our generation? Are you worried about what you hear that is said in schools? Are you worried about where our society is going? Well, my God brings down rulers because those authorities and powers may look like flesh and blood, but can I tell you they're not. They're principalities and powers. And my God, my mighty God brings down rulers. There is no power. There is no theory that can stand against our God. So in a moment when we, we're worried and we're concerned, we can stand on the truth of God and says, he brings down rulers. God, bring down the rulers and authorities that would seek to bring up our children in a different way, that would seek to spread lies to them. God, that you would bring them down in your mighty power. Amen? Amen. 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 He is our mighty God, and she declares hope. She declares hope in a difficult situation. But what I love as well is when we see towards the end of this song, we see truth revealed as well. Her life is interrupted, hope is declared, but also truth is revealed. In Luke 1, verses 54 to 55, she says this. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Truth was revealed and there was a revelation to the nation of Israel. Mary understood that the revelation that she was receiving on that day was actually not just for her, although amazing that it was, but actually it was to the whole nation of Israel. This was the promised Messiah, the one that was going to bring Israel back to God himself. 
They've been waiting hundreds of years for this moment, and she realized what it meant to the children of Israel. Isaiah's declaration started in chapter nine. The people who were walking in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus was going to be the one. He was gonna be that light that was come to the people of Israel, that light that was gonna show them the way back to God the Father. And Jesus today is that light to the nations, that light that says there is a way back back to God the Father. Even though you don't know him and you don't care, Jesus is the light, not just for the nation of Israel, but for our nation, for every nation of the world. And that was the truth revealed in this moment to Mary, that mighty God, Jesus, was the revelation to the nations. And what does that mean for them? What did that mean to the nations? What does that mean for our nation? Oh God, that he would come in power in our world, amen? That he would come to our nations. You know, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking about, imagine if I reckon about three people per home on average. And I was trying to do a calculation. If my street, if my one street came to know Jesus, I live on quite a big street, but even if half of it, my big street, came to know Jesus, I reckon that would be about 200 people. And I thought, That's the size of a decent church, 200 people. That's one street in Aberdeen coming to know Jesus. You know, mighty God coming in power in our nations. What does that look like to us? Comfort for those who were broken. Healing for those. Freedom for the captives. You know, at the moment, we live in a land. We live in a land where churches are crying out for people. But I believe a day is coming in this land where people are crying out for churches. Come on, did you hear that? A land where churches aren't crying out for people, but people stand and say, we need a church in this area. There's 200 of us. You know, I love our expression here. It's wonderful. This is what expression of church that God has called us to. But there is room for so many expressions of church all over this city and this nation. And we got to get ready prophetically and say, do you know we're going to start planting churches? Because people are going to start crying out for churches. No longer will churches be closing. No longer will be saying, where's the people? Because the people will be saying, hey, we need somewhere to go. Do we believe it? He is mighty God. And there is a revelation to the nations. But as we finish today, there is also a revelation to us individually. There is a revelation to us individually. You know, there was one last display of mighty God to Mary, but actually it didn't happen at the nativity scene. It happened about 33 years later when she stood on a hillside next to a cross. And it was the greatest display of might and power that the earth has ever seen. But it didn't look like that. For many, it looked like defeat. It looked like everything had been lost because Jesus hung on a cross, a cruel death, tortured, battered, bleeding. But it was the greatest display of might that the world had ever seen. Because in that moment, as she looked on him, he was the son of man and the son of God. And he took the punishment and the pain of sin upon his shoulders. And he said, it is finished. That is our mighty God. An act that Mary witnessed in that moment. And we don't know what she thought, but she was there and she looked on. And I suppose finally she understood everything that the angel had told her all those years ago. Everything she'd seen in his ministry and his life. And when he said, it is finished, she must have known, yes it is. You are mighty God. You have brought light in darkness. You have taken the punishment and now we have communion with God, a right relationship. The old law is gone. The new has come. And the wonderful news of that is that is available for every one of us. Every single one of us. That beautiful truth. It says in Philippians, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And to all of this, to the angel, to the life that she had bringing Jesus up and to this moment of all of this, Mary's simple response was humility and obedience. It was always the Lord's will. He was the world's savior, he was her savior. He is our savior today. He is mighty God. Do you know what? I think there's three responses to what we hear today. Three responses, two are personal responses and one is a response that we're gonna make together. And the first response I'd love to offer this morning is for people, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior. You've never made a commitment to him. You've never said yes to Jesus coming into your heart. And what I've just spoke about has been a revelation to you. It's been truth revealed that actually Jesus came to die on a cross so that you no longer have to carry the punishment of sin upon your life, but you can come into a beautiful, wonderful, and eternal relationship with God. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that today, to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want to live for you. Now, it may seem strange to do this on a day when, you know, we've got kids singing and you've been invited and family, but actually, I know there are people here because I don't wake up during the night very often. I sleep well. <laughs> but at 3.47, exactly on Tuesday morning, I was woken up. And the first thought I had on that morning was, there are people here today who have come to hear songs sung by children, but I've brought them here because I want to come into their life. I want to get to know them. I love them so much, and they need to have truth revealed about who I am to them. So... We're going to do it very simply this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. We're going to bow our heads in a moment and I'm going to say a prayer. And we'll just repeat the prayer all together. And then I'll ask us to keep our heads bowed. And just if you've prayed that for the first time, you've never given your life to Jesus before, I'd just like you to put your hand up. And there are a team around about and they've just got a wee gift they're going to put into your hand that's going to help you on your journey of faith. So let's bow our heads together this morning because we're all here together. Some of us have known Jesus for many years, some of us for just a few months, and some of us never. But we'd love to give you the opportunity this morning to respond to Jesus. So let's all repeat this prayer together. Dear Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you that you gave your life to take away my sin. Come into my heart. I want to live for you. Amen. Now, while just our heads are bowed, if you prayed that for the first time, would you put your hand up and somebody will put a small gift into your hand? All you need to do is put your hand up. You know, the kids sang it today. He is the best gift ever. He is the best gift that you can receive this, this Christmas season. A gift that won't fade, that won't diminish, that won't even finish when you end this life, but we're with you forever. I'll just give one more moment. If that's you this morning to pray it for the first time, just raise your hand. a second option for response if in this Christmas season you realize actually I've I've strayed away from God I used to know him I've prayed that prayer before but actually in this season I realize that I need to come home and I don't mean to this house I actually mean you need to come home to God's family you need to come home to all that he has for you would you put your hand up now? And I'd love to pray for you. All I need you to put your hand up. If you realize that God's saying, come home. Come home this Christmas. Come home this Christmas. 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus. We thank you for that we are one family, one body. And Father God, just like the, the story of the prodigal son, you are the father that stands looking for us, looking out every day. And we thank you for those who have just responded and said, I want to come home to you. Jesus, you be with them. You would encourage them, Lord God. And in this week, Lord, you would speak directly to them. And your heart of love would just pour out over them today. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do in your life. We pray that this season would be significant for them as they come home to you in this season that your goodness and mercy will follow them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wonderful. Can we appreciate those people who responded this morning? Well done. We're going to make one more response, and it's for all of us this morning. Can we all stand together? Because we look this morning on the fact that He is mighty God. Hope has been declared. Hope has been declared on who He is. And I know for all of us in here, if I said, I reckon there's somewhere in your life an impossible situation that you think God, God cannot work in. It might be a family member coming to know Jesus. It might be a healing for something in your body that you think, I'm not sure God can do that. Whatever it is that you think, oh, I'm sure that's not possible. Do you know what? I'm gonna read you a verse the verse we read earlier. And today before we sing, we're gonna cry out to mighty God. And we're gonna say, do you know what God? Actually nothing is impossible for you. So I want you to get that impossible situation. I, the, I know the one I've got. I know it's for family members. And, I, and I've prayed for them for years and almost I've given up and I've thought, Jesus, I just don't know, is it possible? But today I'm gonna to say, God with you, nothing is impossible. So I want you to take hold of that impossible situation. And this is what the angel said to Mary, for no word from God will ever, ever fail. So let's now raise our voices together with faith, believing that no word from God will ever fail. And let's pray, for, those of, for God to come and work in every impossible situation in this room this morning. Come on, let's praise together. Oh God, we come before you. We believe that you are mighty God. Father God, that you would come in every impossible situation. For every salvation we believe, Lord God, that you, there's nothing impossible for you, Lord God. For every healing that needs to take place, Lord God. For every emotional restoration, Lord God. For everything that you need to do, Lord God. We believe you are mighty God. You are who you say you are. You do mighty deeds. And no word from you will ever fail. In Jesus' name.